Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, we have to time to start. Yes, I would okay. like to be. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, being with us today in special uh, International Journal uh, Club today with a special guest, uh, Professor Peter Nirgan and Professor Alberto Ricata. Um, uh, I can't find the word to describe uh, Professor Peter. Uh, he's the one of the pioneer uh, in the plastic surgery. We are always, he always support us. We are I can't find word to describe uh, him. Uh, most welcome, Professor Peter. And also, I would like to be uh, uh, most welcome for the Professor Roberto uh, Ricata. He's the chief of the oncology mm -hmm. surgery of the Institute Oncological Hernie Moore at Buenos Aires. Uh, he's did a lot of the paper uh, um, and a lot of the activity in this part. We are honored to have. Uh, him with us today, and we have special team, Iraq team, with the, the most senior uh, Dr. Suzanne Jaber, and and uh, also Dr. Arwa, my friend, and the great Thanks. team uh, from Iraq. See, they, they can make a small introduction about uh, your hospital, and I would like to thank you all, my uh, people that accept our invitation today to be with us. Uh, thank thank you so you. much, and. And I would like to apologize about my my colleagues, uh, Dr. Salah. Uh, his wife has some problem in fracture or something in the hospital. He sent the uh, regard for all of uh, you. Okay, okay, thank you, Dr. Arwa and Dr. Yeah. Suzanne. Yes, yes. Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome everyone to this uh, other uh, part of Journal Club. The October month, the uh, breast cancer awareness is dedicated to the reconstruction of post mastectomy. Uh, we are uh, uh, presenting two articles in this journal club. Uh, one of them uh, is about breast sharing. The other one is about using the autologous fat grafting to um, uh, uh, use, uh, used for the uh, irradiated breast following the mastectomy. Uh, our uh, team consists of uh, my dear uh, mentor and uh, colleague, Dr. Susan Fala Jaber, a lecturer at the Islamania College of Medicine. Uh, she is also a plastic and reconstructive uh, surgery specialist at uh, Islamania uh, uh, Burn Plastic Surgery uh, and uh, the Hospital. Uh, and there is uh, two uh, residents, they are um, Arabic board students. At uh, uh, one of them is uh, Dr. Noor Huda. She's uh, a fourth year Arabic board program student, uh, and she will present her article uh, titled An uh, Innovative Autologous Breast Reconstruction Option Musculodermoglandular Axiopath. Sorry, sorry, this is the uh, other <laughs> article. Her article is The Successful Immediate Stage Breast Reconstruction with intermediary autologous saliva transfer in, in radiated uh, patients. We can start, Doctora Nuruhada. Thank you, Doctora, for this nice presentation. It's a great opportunity to be with you in, today in this meeting. I will start to talk about... Yeah. Successful immediate stage breast reconstruction with intermediary autologous lipotransfer in irradiated patient. Its original article published on Global Open on 30 September 2019, uh, 20, uh, in uh, 19th uh, year. Introduction With the breast cancer rate continuing to raise. More women are subject to mastectomy and subsequent reconstruction than ever before. Despite stage implant based procedure being the predominant form of breast reconstruction, these surgeries remain procedurally challenging when radiotherapy is a part of patient oncological treatment regimen. Breast reconstructive outcomes are often poorer in irradiated patients, as evidenced by increased risk of infection capsular contracture, implant exposure, and reconstructive failure. 
Press radiation is further associated with reduced quality of life and diminished patient satisfaction. Based on all these findings, the irradiated patients are generally deemed poor candidate for process-based breast reconstruction. The strategies to improve these outcomes, one of them is delaying the expander to implant exchange at least for six months. The another one is utilizing counter incision at the inframammary fold, uh, utilizing acellular dermal matrices at the inferior pool, and most recently one is introducing autologous fat to improve outcomes. Lipotransfer procedures have evolved significantly via a traumatic technique that developed by Coleman et al. and advent of fat transfer system that permit rapid harvesting and processing of large fat volume. A substantial body of evidence also supports human adipose tissue as being a substantial source of stem cells. Several investigations have suggested that adipose tissue prom promotes angiogenesis and healthy tissue formation via the mobilization of stem cell and secretion of various growth factors. Lipotransfer has now extended into the treatment of radiation-induced tissue damage. The main reason for late effect of radiotherapy is loss of generative cell. Fibrosis also is used as the irradiated skin develop a denser collagen content. Patient and method. Criteria for inclusion was female with breast cancer who underwent skin sparing mastectomy or nipple sparing mastectomy and opted for immediate post mastectomy expander to implant breast reconstruction. Only patients with minimum four month follow up were included in the study. The exclusion criteria who ultimately choose free tissue transfer. The patient separated into two groups. One of them is requiring post mastectomy radiation and those who did not. I will explain on the diagram. The patient who will uh, not, uh, the group uh, that is not radiated group uh, underwent tissue expansion two week post operatively. And at uh, four month uh, exchange of expander to implant, four months from their index of surgery. The irradiated group also underwent tissue expansion two week, then post -op, two week post op, then uh, their regimen of radiotherapy protocol started. Lipotransfer done three months post radiotherapy. And expander to implant exchange done three months post lipotransfer. Patients were seen midway through their radiation course and one week after radiotherapy completion. External beam radiation was uniformly used in all patient population. During a photographing procedure, expander volume ranging from zero to 90 ml was removed to alleviate tension of the skin envelope and accommodate the transferred fat. They typically did not reinflate because the amount of transferred fat always exceeds the amount of fluid removed. <clears throat> Results, uh, 131 breast reconstruction were performed, 18 were irradiated and 113 were not. The average follow-up time for radiated group was about six months, and for the non-radiated group was about 10 months, and the amount of fat transferred ranged from 45 to 153 ml. Discussion. They observed promising outcome of expander to implant reconstruction with lipotransfer performed as a separate intermediary procedure. This protocol result in complication rate equivalent to those seen in patients not requiring radiation. This technique differed in that our aim was to prevent radiotoxicity symptom 
and complication at time of process exchange. But there is a limitation of the study, including lack of control group that consists of irradiated patients who underwent expander to implant breast reconstruction without lipofilling. Small sample size, consistency of skin flab were not formally assessed, additional surgery that necessitated. Also, there is the, uh, this uh, retro retrospective study design which preclude random independent assignment. In conclusion, radiation induced tissue damage poses a challenge for reconstructive surgeons, especially in the sting of post mastectomy process based procedure. There is increasing evidence that photographing has beneficial effect on radiated tissue. This investigation demonstrated encouraging results when autologous lipotransfer was used in facilitating stage expander to implant breast reconstruction in irradiated mastectomized patients. This case show irradiated mastectomized case and undergo and, uh, tissue expansion to it, post mastectomy and lipotransfer, three months post radiotherapy and Three months later, they under, she underwent uh, tissue expansion, uh, implant exchange. This another case, underwent autologous lipotransfer and stage breast reconstruction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great presentation. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Peter Nelligan, as a leading microsurgeon, do you prefer such technique to avoid uh, using flaps like free flaps or uh, local flaps with uh, this simple technique using the PAT injection to improve um, the... I have used, um, I've used both techniques. I. I I don't have any problem using flaps. And in fact, in, in our center, we will not offer radiated patients implant reconstruction. Uh, some patients will insist on it. Um, and one of the things that we have done is to put um, an expander in at the time of mastectomy before the radiation, because there's usually four to six weeks between the time of surgery and the beginning of radiation. And during that time, um, we expand them quite aggressively so that when they come to their, their radiation, um, they've already been uh, expanded at least somewhat. Um, I have experience using the, the Brava technique that Roger Curry introduced where he, he um, reconstructed breasts with fat graft alone. And I had two groups, one non-radiated group, and their results were spectacular. And in the radiated group, the results were not spectacular. Most of the radiated patients did not um, uh, expand sufficiently to, to form a breast mound. But what I did find was what this paper has found is that those radiated patients were converted from patients whom you wouldn't consider for implant reconstruction to patients who could tolerate implant expander reconstruction very well. I, I think your, um, your slide um, outlining the limitations of this study is very important because I, I think this, I don't think this is a good study because as you pointed out, the, the numbers are very small and there's no control group. So they're saying that this works, that lipotransfer works, which it probably does, but they haven't proved that. They haven't shown, they haven't compared a group of irradiated patients who did not have lipotransfer and who had implant reconstruction. And I think that's really, really important. The other thing that uh, problem that I found with this paper was the the, the follow up time for the radiated patients. The average follow up was was uh, was only six months, and for the non radiated patients, it was nine months, and that's not really long enough to see um, problems, particularly problems of capsular contracture, uh, which is one of the problems that radiated patients run into um, uh, down the road, and often longer than just six months. Um, so it, I think it's a very interesting paper. I think um, lipotransfer does work. Um, um, 
Gino Rogata in Italy um, published a paper several years ago where he showed improved um, uh, tissue tolerance uh, in radiated tissue that had been subjected to lipotransfer. So we know that, that um, lipotransfer works. And I, I have used lipotransfer, for example, for um, post mastectomy, post lumpectomy radiated patients who have uh, breast pain and who have significant scarring in their breasts. And by simply injecting uh, fat into the area of scarring, you improve the pain and you soften the tissue very significantly. So I think this technique probably is something that uh, is worthwhile, um, but um, I don't think this paper is a good way of showing it. Yeah, I think it is a little biased toward the fat injection. They are selecting cases with less complications. They excluded patients with systemic illnesses. And they said that the single case with uh, complication had uh, been a smoker. I think yeah, a smoker, smoker. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So in, in our center, we, we generally, we discourage patients who are having radiation or have had radiation, we discourage them from implant reconstruction. We construct them with a, with a flap. In our center, we use, we use DIP flaps all the time, but um, uh, latissimus flaps or pedicle tram flaps, um, autologous tissue is much safer in patients with radiation than, um, than, than any type of implant. Um, but I think lipofilling can level that playing field and make it safer for radiated patients to have uh, expanders and implants. Sure. Do you have recommendations regarding fat injection in cases with, um, as you mentioned, complicated irradiated breast with breast pain or so? Do you have any recommendations or is it the same Coleman technique, I think, further? Um, it, it's basically the, the technique I've used is basically the same. So if I see, and I've seen many patients with uh, post mastect post lumpectomy and radiation pain, um, and in those patients, I just outline, I have the patient show me where the pain is, and that usually coincides with an area of dense scarring, and often you can see. Um, uh, changes in the skin overlying that area, uh, you know, typical radiation changes. And um, I inject them, I inject them with fat. Um, and I, the volume that I inject um, is usually fairly limited initially because the, the, the scarring is so dense. Um, but I can generally inject 20 or 30 cc's of fat. Uh, and often I'll repeat that over a period of, um, you know, a year, year and a half with maybe two or three um, fat injections over that time. And I've found that not only does it improve the aesthetic appearance of the breast, but it relieves their pain very significantly and it softens that area of dense scar tissue. Really nice thing to say. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Alberto Rencati about his experiences with this technique. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I agree with Peter that I think that this study, uh, it's a good idea, but it, it's, it's not a good paper to take into account. Um, what we do is, uh, for us, a fat transfer in conservative surgery after therapy is, is, is our first choice, but in conservative surgery. Uh, when we have implants and radiotherapy, uh, we prefer uh, autologous tissue uh, because, of course, you can always improve some aesthetic result of a, um, an expander or an implant after radiotherapy, but you are always trying to improve something that cannot be compared to autologous tissue. So uh, when you have a radiated patient uh, here at our institute, uh, if we know that she will be under radiotherapy, we try to uh, go for autologous tissue. Uh, but in conservative surgery, we prefer fat transfer. So that's our first choice. Um, regarding the, the paper, uh, I think that uh, it's okay the, what they, they pointed out about limitations. And I think that uh, six months or nine months is not enough time to see the result uh, with fat transfer. Another problem is that you don't have uh, 
the same kind of radiotherapy in, in different centers. And you see patients that uh, you know that you cannot improve with fat grafting something and you must indicate uh, autologous reconstruction. And uh, if you see a, a patient that has had a, a, a good radiotherapy and uh, the skin has elasticity, well, you can try. But uh, it's not that to speak about radiotherapy it is too huge uh, to be uh, something that you can uh, transpose it to all the, the countries and different centers. Um, so I, I would suggest uh, for autologous reconstruction in, in mastectomy after radiotherapy, the first choice and path transfer conservative surgery after radiotherapy. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Suzanne, do you have any remarks about it? I have the same point. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presenter and thank you for our special guests for their sharing their nice experience that we will also get benefit from. I usually uh, do not have experience with uh, such a cases. Uh, we have the autologous reconstruction with the LD flap for mastectomized patients, but uh, I did not do till now um, fat grafting or fat injection to post irradiated areas. Usually because we think that it is uh, uh, devascularized, a bit devascularized, there is damage to the soft tissues, to the collagen fibers of that areas. And I thought that it will not accept a fat. And you know, the patients want the result with every stage. I cannot promise them to, but as uh, Professor Dr. Nilligan showed that uh, injecting small amount of fat will relieve pain and will improve the scar, it's fine. It's uh, very good. We will take benefit from these advices from now. But uh, uh, if we think that putting autologous fat as a substitute for um, the autologous soft tissue transfers, it will not work. It will not give the bulk. We cannot inject large quantities of fat into these irradiated areas. Only to change the quality of the skin rather than filling. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and to improve in pain, as Prof. Dr. Nilligan showed. Yeah, thank you so much. Dr. Ziyad, you, can you please share your experience with us? Do you start this technique yet or not? Uh, thank you very much. I have very limited experience of it, but my experience is that injecting fat in the irradiated breast, uh, you can't really make it. Uh, localized to one place. It keeps slipping away if you inject any uh, large quantity because the skin is so hard and toughened uh, that it's very un, uh, it's very uh, difficult to create a mound of, out of that irradiated area. So the fat keeps slipping away, but yes, definitely the skin quality improves. Thank you. That's Thank my you, very limited personal experience. Yeah, like all of us. <laughs> Thank you so much. What about you, Dr. Ahala? Do you have any experiences or remarks? You are mute. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't have experience with the um, uh, oncological cases. I don't have. So, but I am with the, um, with the, all the comments. And this. Yeah. Thank you so much. I have, a, I have a question regarding lipofilling to the breast. It's not um, definitely about uh, mastectomized or irradiated cases. Um, just a question. We all know that after fat injection, uh, some of the fat will um, underwent calcification. Uh, do you think it's uh, a little bit um, worrying to patient to have uh, lumps at her breast? Do you prefer lipofilling as an option for augmentation, per se? Dr. Nelligan, please. So um, we use uh, fat injection a lot, um, not just for the cases we've been talking about, but for example, if, uh, patients who've had autologous reconstruction, if there are any 
um, contour deformities in the breast, um, we, we treat those with, uh, with fat injection. And I think the technique of fat injection is very important. Um, yes, you can get calcification, but you shouldn't get lumps. If you're getting, if you're getting lumps, then your, your technique is not correct because you're injecting too much fat in, in one area. And so you need to inject the fat um, uh, in, in multiple, multiple passes. Uh, so that you're injecting very small aliquots of, of fat within the tissues. The, the, the radio, our radiologists can, can discern the difference between, for example, uh, worrisome calcification that might be related to breast cancer versus um, uh, the calcification you see with fat grafting, particularly if we tell them uh, you know, ahead of time, ahead of the examination, where the fat has been injected. They, they're, they're generally pretty confident in saying that the, you know any microcalcification that they see is related to the fat transfer rather than being related to breast cancer, um, but the um, uh, the use of fat grafting as an adjunct to um, to uh, autologous reconstruction for breast or really for anything uh, is is wonderful because it reduces the um, the, the the number of uh, revisionary surgeries that you have to do. Fat grafting is very very simple. Um, it can be done even under a local anesthetic if you've got a small area of, of contour deformity that you want to correct. Um, but the technique is very important. Yeah. Do you have um, uh, an upper limit to the CC that you inject in each breast, or you don't? Uh, it depends on the case. Um, obviously, if, if I'm injecting a radiated patient like we've just been talking about, then, then I inject... Um, as much as I can, but in in general, the the tissue is is very dense and very tough, and you can't get a lot of fat in there. And so, I, 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 at the first operation, I would inject maybe maybe twenty cc's of fat into an area on a breast. Uh, but then, subsequently, when they come back, maybe six months later, and the area is much softer, you can get more fat in there. For the non non irradiated patient. Um, there, there really isn't a limit. And in the, in the, the Brava patients that I did, um, uh, I, I, I did um, uh, 20 patients uh, who had not been radiated uh, and uh, who wore a Brava bra, which is like an external suction cup. They wore that um, preoperatively to create swelling in the breast. In those patients, I was able to inject um, 200, 250 cc's. Um, so quite, quite a large amount. Um, but but for the for the revisionary cases and for the the, the the radiated patients, it's a much much smaller amount. Thank you so much. And the same question goes to Dr. Pankati. What about um, fats as lipofilling versus augmentation? Do you prefer it or not? Uh, well, we use it a lot in aesthetic surgery. Uh, for asymmetries, congenitals, uh, contour deformities. And uh, of course, uh, we have a, a lot of patients that after that in, in, in the radiology, uh, you can see some calcifications. So now we have included in the informed consent that the possibility of calcification after fat grafting is possible. Uh, we try to send our patients to the same radiology is capable of uh, distinguishing uh, from benign to malignant calcifications uh, because uh, this leads to a, a higher rate of biopsies, uh, perhaps unnecessary biopsies. But if the, the patient goes out of your uh, circuit and goes to another physician and sees some calcification, surely he will ask uh, some procedure to investigate what's that. So uh, now in the informed consent, we put that uh, calcifications is one of the characteristics of this procedure. Um, and fortunately, there are more cases that uh, take the benefit of fat grafting than those that, who must go to to biopsies, and, uh, but I, I agree with Peter, uh, this is uh, dependent of the technique you are using. So uh, if you really make very small spaghettis of fat uh, and you take the care of making this with small syringe and, and, and small needles, so uh, 
then you have the best of the procedure. If you make lamps and you get oil cysts, it's because you are doing something wrong in the procedure. Uh, but uh, of course, there is no doubt that uh, fat grafting to the breast in aesthetic uh, helps a lot. In those patients that uh, we are making explantations, taking out the, the implant, uh, we usually make the explantation and inverted T uh, reconstruction of the breast and fat graft. Uh, they are really happy with the result. So uh, for us, it's difficult not to think in fat grafting today when you have an aesthetic patient in front of you. Thanks for sharing your experiences, Dr. Ankati. Can I just say one other thing? Can I just say one other thing about fat grafting? It's it's a, it's a wonderful tool, and we've been talking about fat grafting for for breast, uh, but I've used fat grafting for other um, post radiation problems. I have several patients, for example, who had uh, neck dissections and radiation. Um, uh, I had one particular patient who had difficulty swallowing. Um, because of the um, dense scarring in his neck from the um, uh, combination of surgery and radiation. And with, with just selective uh, fat transfer, not very large volume, uh, maybe 10 cc's, um, we were able to relieve that, that problem. Um, and he ended up having two separate um, episodes of fat grafting. But I have several patients like that. So it's a wonderful technique for uh, dealing with post-radiation fibrosis problems. Thanks for your experiences. Thanks for sharing them. Dr. Rafael, about your experience with fat uh, lipofilling for augmenting the breast versus silicone. Are you aware of calcifications or it's okay? Uh, <clears throat> regarding fat injections for augmentation, uh, our experience are still limited, but uh, we did many cases for augmentation as an aesthetic, it is uh, not for cancer patients. And in these situations, it is uh, related to the technique that the doctor uses, and uh, the plane is very important. Some prefers the subcutaneous plane, and uh, I hear in some articles that they use deeper planes, but for myself, it's safer to use subcutaneous planes as much as you can to avoid injuring to the ducts and uh, making uh, using small syringes and not making lumps within the breast tissue itself during the injection. It will prevent the uh, fat necrosis, the localized fat necrosis that appears as a lump later on. And even if we will not make a lump, the, uh, I think the uh, calcification micro or macro calcification is uh, mandatory it will appear but it needs an expert radiologist and the patient must have a preoperative mammogram especially if the age is near the beginning of the 40 and a baseline mammogram mammography after the procedure in order to compare this new mammography with the future ones because any change that happens in the future the, may be compared to the uh, baseline mammography that have the patient and seeing whether it is malignant change or bad forbidden or somewhat else. Thank you so much. What we you, end dear. up with is that all about the technique when you are doing fat injection. Thank you so much. Uh, now Thank we you. are introducing uh, our uh, uh, second resident, Dr. Karar Abdel Hussain, is a third year Arabic board program for plastic and reconstructive surgery. And he will <coughs> present this um, article to us. Go on, Dr. Karar. Start. Uh, yes, do you see the presentation now? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi is about breast reconstruction with musculoderma glandular axio perforator by body called the club or breast sharing. Introduction. Mastectomy is a successful surgical option. Uh, uh, excuse me. Excuse yeah? me. Can you share uh, 
سكرين يور سكرين ميك شيرينج ام شيرينج ات تراي تو شير اوكي <laughs> Patient satisfaction and psychosocial morbidity significantly differ between the two groups. History. Various techniques can be used for breast reconstruction. The autologous reconstruction is usually considered superior to implant reconstruction, owing to higher satisfaction rates uh, to the, uh, and to the absence of the device-related problem. The deep inferior epigastric artery perforator plug is the gold standard. but there is no ideal technique for these patients yet. Breast sharing is a method for patients with hypertrophic breasts. It is one of the lesser known reconstruction method, which uses part of healthy breast as a flap. Multi-state breast sharing procedures were first performed in 1940s. 30 years later, Pontius divided the breast into two equal halves vertically and used it, uh, its medial half for single stage reconstruction. In this presentation, I'd like to present an article of a new surgical approach, uh, which is termed a musculodermal glandular bipedical deflab technique. This one stage technique has minimal complications and favorable scar location. The candidates for this operation is patients with unilateral mastectomy scar and contralateral large breast with grade three toxins. blood supply of this flap, the flap has two vehicles. The first vehicle is the fifth, sixth, and seventh perforating branches of the internal memory artery. Axial, uh, the second vehicle is axial bar external part of the pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery, as it is uh, here in the picture shown. The marking for our operation is the inframemory fold, the sternal line, parasternal line, mediclavicular line, and the new location of the nipple areola complex. To confirm the location of the perforators, the handheld Doppler is the method of choice. Operation. First, we ins uh, first incise the skin and subcutaneous fat, starting from the right parasternal line to the lateral border of the inframemory fold. A similar incision is made 10 CM below the new uh, nipple area complex. After cutting the medial part of the inframemory fold, we dissected the pectoralis major and entered the area beneath it. Then split the muscle into lateral two-thirds and medial one-third. One should pay attention not to dissect the area between the pectoralis major fascia and the breast tissue, as it can damage the vascular structure. After releasing the medial part, we fix it to the flab with the three zero vicral simple interrupted sutures. The aim is to keep the thoracoacromial artery inside the flab and to create the thoracoacromial artery pedicle. Further dissection along the parasternal line uh, through fifth, sixth, and seventh intercostal spaces form the second pedicle, dissecting the inferior adjacent to the xiphoid process and the costal part of the pectoralis major reduces the tension and provide us with the mobility required for transposition. A 3CM horizontal incision is made over the cephoid process parallel to the sixth intercostal space, and the tissue are dissected superiorly and inferiorly. The flap is rotated 180 degrees and uh, transferred into the defect uh, through opening tunneling. However, depending on the location of the mastectomy scar, the flap can be rotated between 90 and 180 degrees, <clears throat> The flap is fixed to the border of the incision made on the mastectomy scar. 
the horizontal cut is sutured over the flap which hides the midline bolt. <clears throat> Here we have a video of flap transferring through the tunnel. <clears throat> The advantages of this approach is low post operative morbidity, short operation time, short hospital stay, single stage, minimal complications, favorable scar location, and higher satisfaction rates, based skin color, texture, and thickness match. Donor site morbidity is avoided and can be safely used in patients with radionecrosis. The limitations of this operation the other used a sample of only two patients, which is a very small sample, and the patient needs a nipple area um, complex reconstruction, so it is not a single stage as mentioned in the article, and only small group of patients meet the criteria of having a large breast with a grade three ptosis. So there is a very few candidates for this operation. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you for the great presentation and for the illustrations that you made. Thank, thank uh, I would you, like to, yes, I'd like to ask our prof, Dr. Peter Milligan, um, what is your idea about this article? And have you uh, uh, liked this idea of breast sharing? Yeah, I've, I've actually used this um, technique um, as you mentioned in your presentation, the number of patients who are candidates for this uh, surgery is very small. It's very limited. I, the ones I've done have been elderly patients. And, and there are a couple of potential criticisms um, for this flap. One is that it's breast sharing. And there's always a concern from the oncologic point of view, if you're dealing with a breast cancer, that you're transferring um, uh, you know, breast tissue from the opposite side um, in, in in a disease that, that not infrequently is bilateral. So uh, there's, there's the, the risk that down the road you could see the development of breast cancer in the reconstructed breast, which is actually from the, the, the normal side. Um, you, you actually don't need the thoracochromial pedicle. Um, in fact, you can do this as a pure perforator flap without taking any um, pectoralis muscle. And the advantage of that is that and the pedicle is, it, it's much thinner, so it's much easier to pass it through that tunnel that you showed. Uh, when you're passing a large box through the tunnel, it becomes more difficult. Uh, and what I've done is to identify the perforators. I actually clamp the perforators to see how many that I need. Um, and I inject into signing green to show how much of my flap is perfusing. If I need more than one uh, perforator, and, and you don't always need more than one, then what you can do is you can take out a segment of costal cartilage between two perforators. You can even take out two segments of costal cartilage, which brings you down to the internal mammary artery and divide the internal mammary artery distally uh, so that you've got uh, a, a really a pure perforator flap with that large um, breast tissue flap that you've shown. So I, th I think it's, a, it's a, a useful technique to think of in a small group of patients who have very totic breasts, uh, and particularly in, in elderly patients, if they, if, they, if they desire a reconstruction and maybe not good candidates for a bigger operation, I think it gives a very, uh, very satisfactory uh, technique. But as you said in your presentation, the number of patients who are candidates for this is very, very small. Thank you, yes, yes, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Alberto Rancati about his idea regarding this article. Uh, yes, uh, another comment uh, is that this is not an original article. Uh, Calendar in the 2000 published this same technique uh, in the PRS, I have the article, I can share it uh, with you. 
uh, exactly as Peter uh, told you, without the pectoralis major, because you, you, you can tailor the flap perfectly just with the fifth intercostal. So uh, you don't need uh, the seven or the six, and usually they are out of range for the flap. So uh, that's difficult uh, to, 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 to tunnelize the, the flap if you uh, preserve, you try to preserve unnecessary uh, the pectoralis and also to, to incorporate more perforators, the, the six of the seventh, as the author says. Um, but uh, of course, it's not a, a technique to, to think uh, in every case, but in that patient with the delayed reconstruction and with the contralateral gigantomastia or large ptosis, uh, you can think in the breast sharing. Uh, uh, but it, exactly the same, without the, the pectoralis has been published 20 years ago by Calendar. Yeah, thank you both of you for your ideas and for sharing the experiences that you have. Uh, Dr. Suzanne, what is your remarks? You are mute, dear. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you for our great pioneers for sharing their experience. And uh, I had the same idea before talking about this difficult looking procedure. I have considered the same point as Prof. Dr. Nidigan said about the oncologic safety of this procedure, because uh, we don't know that uh, normal looking breast uh, will be under um, continuously every year screening for development of further cancer or another cancer in the other breast, you know. And uh, you know, uh, not all the patients will present uh, with the unilateral breast cancer will stay like that, you know. Uh, yeah. This is one point. Another point, uh, passing this large pedicle through this space, you know, between through the intermemory space. Um, and then I don't know how did this, they did this procedure with a single, with a single stage. Um, you know, in, immediately within the video shows that there is a large bulk between the yeah. two breasts. Yes, and uh, after that, uh, I don't know. Did they do any revisional surgery or some liposuction or something to decrease the bulk? Uh, the post-operative result shows that the bulk is fine as if it is, there is no any tissue passing through there. I don't know how did they do it within the same um, one stage. This is another criticism. Plus the difficult procedure, it is not easy. I don't know, yeah. some procedures are very easy to do. I'm not thinking to do such a procedure by uh, this as such a difficult way. Yeah, I agree with you and also, <laughs> It's not a single stage surgery as there is no nipple area complex in one side. Right, right. This we is another uh, another proof that it needs many minor minor techniques yeah. to improve the results. Yeah, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Okay, what about you, Dr. Zia, what Can about your eyes? Uh, I'm sorry, I have absolutely no experience of using this technique. Yeah. Uh, but I think that breast reconstruction is now quite standardized and these uh, fancy flaps uh, will have difficulty finding an indication for their execution. Like in hypospadias, we started with a multitude of, say, 40 or 50 different procedures that could be done. And now it has been narrowed down to just two. I feel breast reconstruction is the same. We have quite standardized methods now, and I would honestly find it difficult to find an indication for this procedure. I, I'm sorry, I have no experience of this. Thank you so much. You gave a nice description for this technique. It's really fancy and difficult to me, at least. What about Can I have a question? Sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm Dr. Sarah. Can I have a question? Um, 
for this technique, he, for in the paper, he uh, described that he can raise the flap, uh, including the enable area complex with or without. Okay, from uh, functional point of view and aesthetic point of view, do you prefer to sacrifice both neighbor and the area or to save one? Okay, because the, the one will be transferred, it will, it will be lacking the sensation. And uh, again, the position is the normal one. I see, I see in the photos that it is laterally displaced. And on the original breast, as a donor site, you have no nibble error complex, so I have to create one. So it's better okay. to do a nibble error complex on the reconstructed breast or the original breast. Okay, and the question goes to our prof, Dr. Peter Nelligan. Um, I, I've only ever done this procedure twice, um, and in both of those cases, uh, in one of the cases, the, um, the flap did not include the nipple areola complex, so that there was no decision to be made. In the other one, it did include the nipple areola complex, but as you, as you mentioned, uh, when the flap was transferred, it was in the incorrect position. Uh, so if I were to do it again, my preference would be to just remove the nipple areola complex and, and uh, reposition it um, either as a free graft or probably as a free graft on the, uh, on, on the non-cancer no. side and then do a nipple reconstruction on the reconstructed breast. And yeah. for the scar in the midline, this uh, vertical scar he made to cut the pectoralis major and this section and so on. From my point of view, I think this is the worst scar that I need to have in breast reconstruction because it will be very difficult to conceal later on with clothes. It will be very showy. All these scars can be hidden except this midline uh, scar. I don't know. This is my point of view. I don't know why your, what's your opinion. You, you don't need that midline scar. The, the way I've done this is to, to, uh, to find, the, uh, find the perforators with a Doppler and then make an incision on the... Uh, the medial portion of the inframammary, as the inframammary fold comes up towards the xiphoid, I make an incision there to find my perforators. Uh, and then once I find my perforator, then I, I um, uh, design the flap, uh, raise the flap on that perforator, and then tunnel it into the other side without making a, without making a midline incision. And I think the reason you can do that when you don't take the pectoralis major, you've got a, you've got a much less bulky pedicle to, to bring, uh, bring across. When you bring the, if you, if you take the pectoralis major with it, you, your pedicle is very bulky um, and, and you may end up with a bulge in the midline or you may have to make that, that um, midline incision. But in, in the two cases that I've done, I haven't had to use that incision. And also in the photos in the same paper for this patient exactly. He, uh, he takes a nebula area complex with a flab, and actually this patient has a very, very, very photic breast. And he's mentioning that he's 40 plus. And though even in ferro for, for breast reduction with this very long medical, I'm, I'm, I'm very hesitating to do uh, even for subiru medial flab or medial uh, flab. I'm very afraid actually to raise a nebula area complex on this medical. So, I'm not sure this, if he takes this lab with, uh, uh, he's lucky enough that this patient survived, the nibble error complex survived with the lab. But what do you think about for this patient with large breast and a very totic breast uh, with long radical, long uh, nibble error complex uh, distance from uh, inframammary fold? And uh, what do you think? Oh. If, 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 I, if I were doing a breast reduction on a patient with a breast like this, then I would do a, um, a nipple graft. I would not try and pedicle it. And so exactly. that's my approach for these patients generally. If they, if they have very totic breasts, I wouldn't risk transferring the, uh, pedic the nipple on a pedicle. It's much safer to do it as a free graft. Exactly. So I don't think it's very wise to take the nipple error complex with the flab even for this totic breast. Do you agree with me for that? Well, well, no. Sometimes, sometimes the way your flap is designed, you have to take it. If the if the nipple areola complex is within your flap, it can be it can be difficult to design a flap that doesn't include it. Um, if you look at the the picture that's on the screen right now, the nipple areola complex is right at the bottom of the of of the breast and is included in in would be included in the design of the flap. Um, so it would be very difficult to to not include it. Uh, you'd end up with a smaller flap. 
Uh, I think it's quite safe. It, it, it'll survive. There, there'll be no sensation or anything like that. Um, but my preference would be to remove it um, subsequently and do bilateral nipple reconstruction sub subsequently. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nelligan, you mentioned uh, a nice uh, thing that when you have an extremely and an extremely lithotic breast, you prefer to uh, use a nipple areolar graft. What is your um, limit for using uh, a flab based areolar complex? And when you are preparing to use um, areolar grafts? Um. I don't have hard numbers for you. I, I don't have hard measurements that I use. Uh, I usually do it just by uh, by the appearance of the patient. So just if you look at the breast that's on the screen at the moment, uh, yeah. there's no way that I would pedicle a nipple like that uh, up to the normal position. I would I would take it off, do the mastectomy or do the um, uh, reduction and and take and put the the nipple on as a graft in in the position that I wanted to have it. Um, so a lot depends um, not just on the size of the breast, but also on the position of the nipple within the breast. If you have a very totic breast and the nipple yeah. is, um, is extremely distal, then, then I would uh, probably opt for a nipple graft. Alberta, what's your approach to that? Uh, I think sometimes I prefer to do uh, spiromedial flaps because it's um, highly vascular, but sometimes I'm afraid of losing the nipple area complex with necrosis. So um, I don't know if there is um, a rigid number that can uh, be used to uh, avoid such a terrible thing. No, I mean, I've, used, I've done pedicled nipples on, on large breasts, um, yeah. but I don't hesitate to do um, a, a nipple graft if I'm, if I'm worried at all that the uh, distance of transfer on a pedicle is going to be too much. Because the, the, trans, the, the nipple graft actually works quite well. Yeah. Thank you so much. What about you, yeah. Dr. Alberta? Uh, I, in, 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 I, I love uh, grafting the, the nipple complex, so I, I don't want to suffer anymore. So yeah. uh, today, in, 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 in skin-reducing mastectomies, we always graft the nipple complex, and the results are wonderful. So I, I really... Uh, I, I'm not afraid of uh, proposing a patient in a, in a, a large breast reduction uh, to make a graft of the nipple area complex because I know that it works if you make a, a good graft and uh, uh, you have a good intake of it. So in those cases where you have a very glandular uh, breast and the, the, the nipple area complex, the pedicle can be compressed and you, you think you are going to have uh, some suffering of the tissue, it's better to make a quick reduction and grafting position and you, you, you will love the result. Uh, it's, it's very quick uh, because the, the problem is the, to take the decision. Uh, but if you are decided before surgery that you are going to do that, you make a very quick uh, breast reduction and you can make really a great difference in size and you don't uh, take uh, the, the risk of uh, ischemia of the nipple complex. So uh, for me today, if I need to move the nipple, I decide to make a, a graft. So uh, of course you, you must take into account the age of the patient, uh, the sensitivity, well, all these topics. But for the from the technical point of view, it's a, a, a great procedure. I, I agree with you. I, th I think people people go to all sorts of uh, measures to pedicle a nipple because they're afraid that, the, that if they graft it, it's not going to work. But as you said, Alberto, the results are, are really good, and yeah. and and it makes it very quick and easy without any. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Thank you. What about you, Dr. Suzanne? Do you have any remarks? Um, thank you, Arwa. But I think in spite of all these criticisms, this procedure works because uh, for such a atrophic, severely ptotic breast, 
it makes a solution for these uh, ladies, especially for old ladies, and uh, she will be uh, offered um, something that corrects the normal breaths and gives some tissue to the mastectomized area without exposing her to, um, you know, long time times of operation and other sites for morbidities. Is it still worthy? Yeah, it's a breast balancing uh, plus uh, reconstructive to the mastectomized styles. I agree with you. Yes, exactly. With lesser operative time, if we add another surgery, adding tissues from elsewhere and making surgery for symmetries on the normal breast. Yeah. Anyone have any question? Despite what people think? said, this is this is not difficult. It's 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 actually very quick and easy to do. Um, but. Yes. Uh, but, but for a very limited number of patients. As you said, uh, elderly patients uh, with very totic breasts who, who, who don't want to be flat on the other side, it's a very simple thing to do. Yeah. Yes, Thank sir. you so much. Thank you. Thank I you have all. one question. I have yeah. one question for Professor Peter and uh, Professor Alberto. With the hundred of uh, papers uh, about breast reconstruction in the literature, okay? Uh, is there uh, an ideal criteria for breast reconstruction uh, settled up till now or no? And um, is there a protocol for reporting the outcomes? Because uh, I believe that with the many techniques, there is no ideal techniques. Uh, so how can we compare these techniques together about the outcomes? Well, I, I think... Um... We offer breast reconstruction to basically any patient who wants it. So when patients are seen at our breast clinic, the, the, uh, the oncologic surgeon will, will talk to them about breast reconstruction. And if they want to see one of us, then, then uh, they will be sent to see us and they'll have their reconstruction. So there's really no limitation. The only limitation is somebody who's got multiple medical comorbidities where they may not be a candidate or, or very extensive disease where they may not be a candidate. And, and I think one of, the, one of the best tools that we have for evaluating uh, results um, is the, uh, the breast cue. The breast cue um, is it's patient reported outcomes um, and it's been translated into multiple languages. Um, so it's, it, it's a fairly standardized way of assessing results um, that I think um, is in wide use and very useful. No, I mean to compare, if you have two techniques to compare this one to the other one about the outcomes, because I see each technique is uh, more or less customized for a group of patients. It's more suitable for a group of patients. So how we can compare these techniques together? In, in our practice, there are basically two, two, two basic techniques that we use. Uh, if we're using autologous reconstruction, we use a, a, a DIEP flap. If we're using uh, expander implant reconstruction, we use expander implants. Uh, we use... Um, um, and we only change that plan if there's if there's some particular reason. So, <clears throat> for example, if somebody has had previous abdominal surgery and is not a candidate for DIAP flap, then we will look at one of the alternate flaps. But the vast majority of patients get uh, either a DIAP flap or or, or uh, expand or implant reconstruction. So there there aren't that many different techniques that we use. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, I, I agree. But I mean, because every day and every other day in the literature, there is some people describing a new technique like this one, uh, like uh, severe gluteal artery flap, like um, so by charging of the flap. A lot of techniques evolving. Maybe it's, it's improving of the already present techniques. But I mean, if, if I want to compare for example, the deep uh, the gastric artery flap with a superior artery flap as a free flap. Uh, I mean, uh, what what are the criteria of the ideality of the technique to describe? That uh, that was my uh, concern. Okay. 
Okay, everyone, anyone has any question left? Uh, so I, I think I think um, a lot yeah. of it a lot of it comes down to your interpretation of the literature. So, for example, this paper gives an interesting technique, but there are only two patients, um, so it's not a mainstream technique. And and if you really carefully read a lot of the other techniques, uh, you know the previous one, for example, um, just uh, had no control group. Uh, so you can find. You can find reasons why a particular paper is, is not good. Um, in my book, unless somebody presents very convincing data that the what technique they're proposing is much better than the technique I'm using, I'm not going to change. And, and a lot depends also on, on the results you're getting from whatever technique you're using. If you're getting great results from whatever technique you're using, then why change if it's already good? Um, you know, the, the, the enemy of good is perfect. Um, so <laughs> I if, agree. You're, if you're getting good results, stick with it. I agree. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Is there any question left? Uh, I have one question. Uh, <laughs> For uh, Professor Peter, yes, uh, Professor Alberto, it's not related to the reconstruct. I'm talking about the, about the lipofilling, fat grafting, and the um, breast augmentation. Uh, do you recommend this? Uh, recently, a lot of cases doing the lipofilling in the breast for the augmentation. Um, do you think it's the now the nowadays they all uh, all or going to this um, kind of procedures. Um, do you recommend this or still, <laughs> I need uh, your uh, opinion and experience in this no, point. I, Thank you. I, I, I think I that know. the fat graft, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Uh, no, thank you, Peter. I, I don't think that fat grafting is going to replace uh, implant augmentation. Uh, uh, but uh, it's really a tool that you cannot miss today. Uh, in cases with asymmetries, we prefer not to put the same implants and to correct with fat grafting. Uh, and in contour deformities or in congenitals, uh, uh, we use uh, fat grafting a lot. Um, all so as I told you, in explantations and reconstruction. So I think that today, uh, fat grafting to the breast is a reality. It has been proved to be safe. Uh, you cannot avoid using it. So you must have your kit of instruments in every breast augmentation because uh, there is a, a lot of situations where you can use it. Uh, also, you can prevent, in some cases, some of the rippling uh, in those skinny patients that you are, are looking for a breast augmentation. So I think it will not replace the implants yeah. uh, because the core project that you, you obtain with an implant, uh, it's, 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 it's not the same as what you can do with fat grafting, but you can enhance your results, and that's why the hybrid uh, augmentation it's having its place. Yeah, I, I don't have any experience with um, fat grafting for augmentation. Um, I, I've only done breast reconstruction, but in, in um, I agree with Alberto that the if if you have somebody who's had an implant reconstruction, they've got rippling or they've got some contour uh, abnormality, fat grafting is a great way of of correcting that. Um, and it's 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 quick and simple and and works very well. You have to be careful that you don't puncture the implant. Um, I, have, I have a great picture of an implant with a thread of of fat within it, uh, so you got to be careful of that, particularly in the reconstructive patient, less so in the augmented patient. But um, but yeah, it's a great technique. Yeah, thank you. And, and another tip for that. Uh, is that it's better to make the augmentation with, with, with fat previous to the implant insertion. Uh, two benefits. Ah. You avoid puncturing the implant, as Peter told you, 
and you don't have fat in the pocket. Uh, so first do the fat grafting and then the augmentation. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, anyone had a question to ask from the audience? Like there is no questions. Uh, yes. Yeah. So we need to wrap this. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Peter Nalligan. Thanks for honoring us with your presence, and thanks to Dr. Alberto Rancati for your presence. You both honored our uh, journal club with your presence and your knowledge, your experiences. Thanks for. Uh, uh, being patient with all of us and our questions, which are regarding the articles and away from the articles. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thanks for um, sharing your experience again. And thanks to Dr. Zia, uh, Dr. Rahala, Dr. Uh, uh, Mohamed Salah for um, granting us this opportunity to host a journal club from Iraq, from Baghdad and Slemania. Thanks to our uh, nice residents, Dr. Anur al Hoda and Dr. Karrar. Thanks to uh, Dr. Susan, our mentor, our colleague. And thanks <laughs> to all yes. the attendees. Thank you so much. And wish to meet you in person one day. Thank, thank you, you so everybody. much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to, uh, I would like to thank all of you. Yes, thank, um, you. thank you for all. Thank you, Dr. Peter, Alberto, Iraq team, and all attendancy. And uh, we will be um, meeting next month, inshallah. Um, um, best regard from me and from uh, Dr. Zia and Dr. Salah. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. It's Bye. a great honor, everyone. Fantastic work, Iraq. Uh, the team Bye. from Iraq, fantastic work indeed. Yes, and thank, thank you very strong much. For women, the time. Strong women, uh, strong women uh, team. Only uh, Dr. Yeah, Karar is, uh, <laughs> is only the male in the team. <laughs> lovely, lovely meeting you all. Yes, thank okay. You. Bye. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. bye bye. Have a nice day. Thank you, everyone. Day. Thank you, everyone. Again. Have a great day. Goodbye. Wish to meet you again. Have a nice day. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.